please join me in welcoming Paula Dobriansky. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you so much, Graham. And I have to say I'm very, very pleased uh, to be here at the Camden Conference. You truly have brought together, really, a, an array of very distinguished speakers. And what I have enjoyed in particular has been the opportunity, not only now to be able to address you, but also to sit in the audience with you and to hear such a distinguished array of speakers. But I have to tell you, Nyon mentioned that he didn't have wine at, the, at lunch. Well, nor did I, but I am reminded of uh, a story, and in fact, about the days of Rome. As you may know, that during the days of Rome, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, they would do various things in the stadium and arena. And they would bring young men and women into the arena and feed them to the lions. Well, after two weeks of starving the lions, they opened the gates, and they were bringing in a group. And the group was headed by St. Peter. And when they came in, and these lions were pacing, St. Peter went over to the lead lion. And he whispered something into the lead lion's ear, whereupon all of the lions immediately lay down. The crowd was appalled, so they started throwing stones. The lions wouldn't get up. They started jabbing them with pitchforks. They wouldn't get up. Finally, Caesar called. St. Peter over, and he said, what did you whisper to that lead lion? And St. Peter said, well, I said, of course, there'll be speeches after the meal. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm your second lineup after the meal. <laughs> um, but we have a very important topic, and one that I was very delighted to be able to come and to talk about. And this is the important issue about how we align our values and our interests, and really through the mechanism of global issues. And you've heard the term earlier this morning, soft power. This is, I think, really one of the key areas of application that can, in fact, have ramifications on such an alignment. You know, I, I was mentioned I'm the, uh, was the George F. Kennan Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and I want to share in his memoirs, one of America's great diplomats reflected the following. He said, quote, the fact is that one moves through life like someone moving with a lantern in a dark woods. A bit of the path ahead is illuminated and a bit of the path behind. But the darkness follows hard on one's footsteps and envelops our trail as one proceeds. Were one able, as one never is, to retrace the steps by daylight, one would find that the terrain traversed bears, in reality, little relationship to what imagination and memory had pictured. Well, here we are constantly seeking to improve the scope and range of that lantern, which I think Kennan wrote so that it might cast light further down the path ahead. One of the studies that was done and updated over the last number of years was done by the National Intelligence Council. You heard it mentioned a few times uh, today. Uh, it focused on global trends, and the most recent one looking at 2025. I like the first one that was put out especially because what that report did was call attention to policymakers as to the importance of global issues of soft power issues. That if you don't pay attention to issues such as that of the environment, water, air, um, you don't deal with migration flows, you don't deal with the issue of human rights questions, that a lot of these issues can breed instability, chaos, conflict. In other words, the drivers, as it was termed in the study, will affect policy, and policymakers need to have a very active uh, grasp of these issues and actively engage and think about them. Now, from climate change to human rights and democratization, science, technology, health, humanitarian issues, trafficking in persons, the global affairs portfolio is varied, and at a first glance, you might say, well, it's a very disparately connected one. 
But on closer examination, I think one can say that it becomes clear that what links these issues and our instruments for addressing them is an interconnected concern with soft power. All of these issues are transnational. All of them involve non-governmental organizations working closely in tandem with government. And also, all of them involve uh, international organizations or regional organizations. Um, these are interconnected with soft power, and about which my former professor at Harvard, Joseph Nye, has written so eloquently and so incisively about. Here, I would like to specifically look at those instruments of soft power and look at it in a context that we will see that it is less a zero-sum question than an instrument for the long-term alignment of our interests and also of our values. And I think an important message here for the new administration is that this is a critically important area for the current set of policymakers, not only to appreciate this alignment, but to really look at ways of considering of how to strengthen it and how to use it actively. There are four areas that I wanted to address to give you some examples of this and to breathe life into this whole thesis that global issues matter, so does soft power, that the United States does have a leadership role in these areas and it can be effective if executed uh, um, effectively and appropriately. And also, uh, thirdly, that the public-private partnerships, the role of non-governmental organizations in this is absolutely a critical one. The four areas to be addressed, democracy and human rights, the issue of health, the issue of climate change and the environment uh, more broadly, and then science diplomacy. Let me begin with the issue of democracy, uh, democracy promotion. This has been a component of US policy for decades, but it truly has come under a great deal of close examination in recent years. I would say that without question, there have been, and I will say there will continue to be in this area, contradictions. But these do not, in my opinion, undermine the integrity of the effort. I think that there are some recent examples that I think can be benefited, um, uh, can benefit and be benefit us and can be particularly instructive in a discussion of the means of democracy promotion. And let me mention three basic principles that I think really matter for this area. One is, First, not relying on a cookie-cutter approach and cookie-cutter solu solutions for democratic tr transitions. You just can't do that. I think that in the United States, we have our own con conception uh, and relative consensus on the universality of freedom and human rights, but also the point that no two countries and the circumstances of no two countries are identical. And what worked in one country may not exactly work in another country. So the point here is you can't just merely take the experience of the United States and transplant it on the soil of another country. You have to take into account uh, the importance of local environments, including historical, cultural, religious, and ethnic considerations. Let me go to the second. The second is that multilateral cooperation is integral to successful democracy promotion. There are a number of examples that I can share with you where I think this has mattered and will continue to matter. The first being that during the past years, um, there was the rise and the creation of the United Nations Democracy Fund. In this case, actually, it was President Bush, and there was a question about what work we're doing with India. It was with India and with Prime Minister Singh that this fund in the United Nations was, in fact, created. Why does it matter? It actually matters because the resources uh, in this fund go to non-governmental organizations, not to governments, but to those members of civil society who are looking for assistance and are in need and want to advance democracy uh, in, uh, in their communities. Let me give a second example, and that is the community of democracies. The community of democracies, the first meeting was held in the Clinton administration. Secretary Albright went to that meeting. It was held in Poland. 
Well, since that time to the present, there have been a number of Community of Democracy meetings. And what's significant about this entity, it is Alliance of Democracies, and they come together to actually look at where we are, where we need to go, and maybe how we can actually, through the sharing of experience, help one another. I'll give two examples within the community that I thought were very practical ones. And by the way, not all of them were practical ones, but two that were. One was um, where uh, we actually initiated bringing the Organization of American States together with the African Union, and actually to get the interlocutors to both to sit down and to look at what are the relevant experiences that they could identify and share with one another. The good news is, is that now, when this was initially sponsored by the Community of Democracies, now actually the OAS and the AU have set up their own bridge and they're doing this, and they're doing this regularly. That's a good thing. The second one is where the Chileans came forward. They were the host one year, and they actually recommended that we have a multinational delegation go to East Timor. And the idea was to help East Timor with its democracy advancement. I will tell you, the United States was part of that delegation. There were about, I'd say, maybe 12, 13, 14 countries. But in my view, the one that actually had the greatest resonance in this case and application to what was happening on the ground actually was Cape Verde in Africa. Why? Because it's a Lusophone country, port, uh, 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 just the same as that of uh, East Timor. It also had dealt with issues of corruption, issues of, of trying to grow, and it's also a very small uh, island state. The application of what they brought to that delegation was, I think, one of the most potent experiences. So here, multilateral cooperation um, is really important. I want to mention this morning, a number of you heard um, uh, my colleague uh, Nick Burns uh, identify a few of us in the audience. and. Uh, he mentioned uh, my colleague, uh, Kristen uh, Silverberg. I want to mention her other half in this, Paul Leto, who's here, who was working at the National Security Council. And the reason why I want to mention him is he worked um, uh, uh, very hard, long and hard, on uh, the establishment of an Asian democracy partnership. And the purpose of which, again, is to work with countries in Asia and to figure out what are the needs. What do you need? Let's, let's work with you on this and see where we can go from there. And that kind of coalition building, I think, is very, very important. The third element of this particular area is empower agents of change. For really having a sustainable impact, it's important to work with the interlocutors on the ground. And only then, I think you can say that you will witness um, at least uh, the strong possibility of a sustained change and sustained progress. And in this regard, I want to weave in the notion of women as agents of change. We heard about Afghanistan, and one of the areas that I worked uh, quite a bit with were, happened to be women in Afghanistan. Two areas that I think they've been important agents of change. Although it's a grave situation and difficult situation and a complex one security-wise, there have been a number of significant changes on the ground that I think are very noteworthy. And I think the women had a lot to do with it. The first being, they were grappling with the issue of running for office. And they were looking at various models. They were looking at what their neighbor Pakistan was doing. They were looking at what we do in the United States. In the end, they determined that what they wanted and the kind of legislation that they wanted in Afghanistan was to have specifically an allotment of seats to which women would run for. The second area is relative to business. The first time I went to Afghanistan, it was striking to me, I met two young women who were no more than maybe 24 years old, and they were setting up a micro-lending bank. And that bank, specifically, was to provide assistance to um, uh, women and others who wanted to grow their businesses. The second time I came back, we had to meet in the huge cafeteria because you had close to 80 to 100 women who were owning all sorts of businesses, kites, a cement factory, furniture. The last time I went, they established a federation. 
And there, what they were doing, first they said they did not want to join the federation, actually, of which the men had formed. And why? Because they had their own resources and they wanted to keep their own resources. But secondly, they also set up their own labels. So that kind of economic growth also feeds into change on the ground and assists in such processes as that of, um, of uh, democracy, the promotion of democracy. I think the most effective strategies are ones that complement our overall approaches um, uh, and our overall, if you will, uh, strategic approaches to regions. Let me now say some words about the area of health. Health is an important um, national security issue. As we know, infectious diseases cross borders. They're not going to stop at a border. International collaboration is essential in this area. Here, uh, I will pick out one area that maybe you heard about a lot in the news, but not so much in recent time, and that's about avian influenza. On avian influenza, uh, three years ago, actually, there were only about 30 to 40 countries that had preparedness plans. Now there are some 130 countries that have preparedness plans. There have been a series of international meetings through what's known as the International Partnership on Avian and Pandemic Influenza. Uh, the first was uh, held in the United States, then it was Austria, then it was India, then it was Egypt, and, and this year it will be in Vietnam. And I think what's important here is that there's a network for not only sharing of information, there's a network that's also, that's come together to deal with scientific research collaboration and also the development of a vaccine, and at the same time providing capacity in those areas where it is needed. This is an area that I think that uh, we also, we learn from one another. Why I especially wanted to mention this issue to you is, is because it's one that traditionally is not associated really with the work of the State Department. In fact, I went to a conference in Ditchley and I remember some of my international colleagues there had said, we didn't realize the State Department has a health office. Um, this is a key area and this goes back to the point of soft power issues and where such collaboration not only benefits us and our interests, but at the same time, I think very significantly, also um, uh, uh, benefits our relationships with others and also does and results in some very good things. And this is certainly one of those areas. Let me go to the third area of climate change and the environment. You're going to be hearing fully on uh, climate change um, uh, after the break, but I want to say some words about this because it is a very important issue internationally. It matters globally. It matters here at home. This year in particular, uh, 2009, is a critical year because it's this year, at the end of this year, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change will be holding uh, the gathering and conference in Copenhagen where the goal is to have an international agreement that addresses climate change. We want to see such an agreement. We want to have the United States as part of that agreement. We also want to see, by the way, to have those what we call major emerging economies also be part of that agreement, meaning India, China, South Africa, Indonesia. That is absolutely essential because in the end, what we're looking for is an agreement that is environmentally um, uh, effective and also economically sustainable. And in order to achieve that, when you look at, with the birth of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, 1990, and what the situation is now, you look at the growth of, of China, India, as I mentioned, Indonesia, South Africa, they can't be compared with, in the developing world, small island states. And so there is an expectation the developed world will do its part, the United States must do its part. At the same time, um, these emerging economies also must be part of, of, of that agreement. Um, here, technology, I think, is one of the key areas. Um, to come up with an environmentally effective and economically sustainable solution to climate change, we really need nothing less than a clean technology revolution. And you know, I'd say 
maybe a few years ago, some thought that maybe that was going to really be far off. But today, I think that revolution has truly begun. Only the last years, uh, I know in the Washington, D.C. area, we have a hydro power station in which some of the test cars are being tested in that area. A lot of work's being done on carbon sequestration. Um, work is uh, being done extensively in the renewable areas um, and alternative energies. Um, here, I would even say with the global financial crisis, which is often a question, how is this going to affect this revolution? There are some cost-effective ways forward um, that can be achieved. Now, let me mention several other areas, if I may, of just the environment. I've also mentioned public-private partnerships. In this area of climate change, I think one of the effective instruments in dealing with countries like India and China have been uh, through entities in which you bring the private sector and the public sector together. There's an entity known as the Asia Pacific Partnership on Clean, on, uh, um, clean Climate, excuse me, clean, <laughs> Asia Pacific Partnership on Clean Development and Climate. And specifically, this uh, partnership brings together uh, interlocutors in very practical ways. As China goes forward, they're looking for practical solutions as to how to deal with the issue of climate change, but also how to grow their economy. I had the good fortune of actually um, uh, uh, participating in a signing ceremony that was taking place between one of our laboratories in the state of Washington with Chinese officials. And the monies that were going to this lab and to, in this case, uh, the uh, memorandum that was being uh, signed was actually to help, in this case, the um, uh, uh, Chinese deal with building codes. There are some basic areas in which you can become energy efficient and that it goes a long way, ultimately, in terms of the reduction of greenhouse gases and also you're being responsive environmentally and you're also being responsive to your goals and objectives um, economically. In this area, it just doesn't only go with um, uh, um, uh, the issue of climate change. There are other issues. Let me just give you a few. I don't know if you're familiar with what's known as the Tropical Forest uh, Conservation Act. This basically provides an incentive to other countries to alleviate their debt in return for preserving their tropical forests. And specifically, it's done through our Department of Treasury. Um, and in the past, I don't know uh, in terms of the future for this, but in the past, this has been a very good incentive for other countries to come forward and uh, to undertake action in preserving their forests. One of the public-private partnerships that I have to say I think was truly one of the most effective ones is the Congo Basis, Basin Forest Partnership. This was launched in 2002 by then Secretary um, Colin Powell at the World Summit on Sustainable Development. And what it does and what it is doing, it brings together a band of countries in the Congo Basin with European countries, with the United States, with a number of non-governmental environmental organizations along with a number of businesses. And the purpose of which is to protect the Congo Basin from uh, illegal logging, from uh, illegal wildlife trafficking, and to promote ecotourism. Those kinds of initiatives, I think, are the kinds of instruments in this area that go a long way. Let me mention the last area that I wanted to hit, and that was science and technology. Here, this is an often overlooked instrument of soft power that exists in the dialogue of nations. Um, and it's worth note noting, in fact, that the proverbial father of the American Foreign Service, Benjamin Franklin, he himself was an amateur scientist. And often, it was his extracurricular experiments that first intrigued and also charmed America's first strategic ally, France. This was one of the areas of discourse. Well, this area is not only about signing agreements with other countries, but it's what happens after you sign the agreements. Let me give the example of one. Um, and that is, we signed an agreement with Uruguay on science and technology. 
And there was a multi-tiered delegation that went down to Uruguay in the aftermath of the signing of the agreement that involved the American Association for the Advancement of Science, that involved the National Institutes of Health, as well as Southcom, as well as representatives of different governmental agencies. And the multi-tiered delegation sat down with the Uruguayans and listened to what they needed on the ground to really advance and implement that science and technology agreement. I don't know how many of you know this, but the president of Uruguay happens to be an oncologist. And one of the issues that he's very consumed with in Uruguay is cancer, and in particular, the issue of breast cancer. Uh, he has made it a priority to actually build a state-of-the-art cancer institute there. Well, this was one of the areas that this team, in fact, was looking at. Now, why I share these examples with you is to breathe life in it to, so you can see that instruments like this do add an important dimension to our relationship with other countries. Um, there was the question this morning, uh, which I think was an important one. It was back here when someone asked my colleague Nick Burns, well, what about soft power? You know, isn't this an area that we can be doing more and it can help? My answer to that question is, as he said, yes, there are strategic interests that we have and that we grapple and we deal with. And that at the same time, though, I will say that these are areas that just at the same time, it's not mutually exclusive in most cases, but not all cases, where you can advance a relationship with other countries in areas that will not only, I think, uh, uh, breed goodwill, but at the same time also will affect our interests favorably as well as global interests. One last comment that I would like to make to just put uh, 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 this into also a broader perspective, and that is managing global resources. There are a lot of issues that are challenging on managing global resources. And I, I didn't want to go away from addressing you without saying some words about uh, several areas where managing global resources will matter. One is the Arctic. Uh, the other is Antarctica, and another is water. Um, in terms of the Arctic, interestingly enough, there is an Arctic Council that exists that brings the nations of Canada, Russia, Denmark, Norway, as well as Sweden and Finland, United States, together. And the meetings are held with also the private sector. And the discussions focus on the needs of the Arctic. In this area, one of the things that I personally would like to see happen, actually, is the Law of the Sea Treaty um, uh, ratified, advanced and ratified, because I think it will have direct ramifications for these resources of the Arctic and also for where the United States is sitting on these issues. But this underscores our strong commitment to scientific cooperation and our belief that the development of the Arctic can and should be one in which we're interacting with others. On the Antarctic Treaty, I wanted to mention it because this is the 50th anniversary this year of the Antarctic uh, Consultative Treaty. And it happens that the United States is actually hosting the meeting in Baltimore in April. It's also the International Polar Year. This treaty has been remarkable. It was adopted at the height of the Cold War. It was one of the first agreements to regulate nuclear weapons. And since then, it has been a remarkable platform for scientific collaboration and environmental protection, all the while preventing disputes over territorial claims. Finally, I mentioned water. I wanted to say some words about water here because you have over a billion people lack access to safe drinking water, and more than two billion people lack access to adequate sanitation for facilities. This is an area that the management of global resources will matter. Our interactions with others uh, also matters. Um, here, as a soft power issue, as that National Intelligence Council report stated, that conflicts over water can and will breed instability. We've seen it already in a number of border disputes over just this very issue. 
So in sum, global issues matter greatly. Here, soft power is an instrument by which we can advance our relationships with other countries and in some very creative ways. The United States leadership in this matters. And finally, as part of that, public-private partnerships, I think, are one of the new and very creative instruments that can have a tremendous impact on diplomacy and the way forward. And what I look forward is, with the new administration, to seeing the new administration move forward in these areas and advance them in very creative ways with other countries. Thank you so much.